Well, good morning. Um, here's your first disappointment. I'm actually not going to speak about astronauts, astronaut selection, or uh, ast uh, NASA. Mm -hmm. Because I figured this was a conference on soldier resilience, and so I thought maybe I would tell you a little bit about work we have done um, with uh, uh, the assessment selection of uh, high-risk, what we call high-risk operational personnel, and what lessons we've learned in terms of resilience. Um, and and uh, ooh, uh, so uh, that's uh, number one. But let me also first start by uh, thanking. Um, Trey, thank you for allowing me to, uh, to be here today. I'm actually uh, standing in for Dr. Tom Williams, uh, formerly of the Army War College, and Tom couldn't be here today because of some work uh, conflicts. So um, I was asked if I would step in, and I'm delighted to be able to have the opportunity, and I want to thank you very much. Um, I also um, have a standard disclaimer. Mainly that's to say my major objective today is to embarrass only myself, certainly not the U.S. government nor any agency that I worked for in the past or, or now. Um, also, let me add a caveat to that, uh, which is that uh, I am not a researcher or academic. I'm an operational psychologist, a clinical psychologist by training. So we do the applied work. Um, I will show you data as we have time. One of the great things I learned at NASA is we have backup slides in case you get through everything and there's time left over. And I don't think there's any chance that's going to happen. But I do have backup slides if we need them. But that's where the data resides. Uh, again, not a scientist uh, or academician in that regard. But we do attempt to empirically validate our work. That's a standard in assessment and selection. So I do have the data to back up some of these uh, comments. Uh, another caveat is the information that I have and which shapes my potential biases in the area of resilience comes from work that is fairly specialized um, and that uh, the folks that we deal with are predominantly males. They are highly selected uh, already before they even come to us. So I want that, I'd like you to bear that in mind as we go through some of these things. Um, you've heard from um, my colleagues here who did a wonderful job. Um, setting me up for failure um, in, in uh, talking about resilience. And I don't want to uh, spend the time to, to go into that, except to say, as you probably have already surmised, that it's a very confusing construct and very difficult to uh, really get your arms around because there are multiple definitions of what resilience is. And they range from whether resilience is seen as a capacity of an individual, whether it's the process of engagement itself, or whether resilience is solely the outcome of having dealt with adversity or stress. Um, I, as a psychologist, as a dispositional psychologist, I tend to fall on the side of capacity definitions. Again, that's a certain bias, and I, you know, uh, own that. Um, we deal with resource models of resilience, and that is that resilience basically, um, you know, is like other resources, and it has. Uh, uh, you know, we have limits on it and we have amounts of it. And the idea is that those endowed with more resilience are better able to withstand the depleting effects of uh, the res these resources, sort of like your bank account, as you have things come up that you have to spend money on on emergencies, you deplete that bank account and you need to replenish that. Some people start with big bank accounts, others uh, more modest. And so that's sort of the resource model. It gets more complicated than that, but, but we work at the fairly basic level. Those resources can include individual predispositions. We hear about things like spirituality. Um, uh, we have other constructs out there. Self-esteem is one of them. Coping, <coughs> optimism, all of those things that, that are out there that you probably have I've heard about, as well as extrinsic kinds of resources, family support, uh, peer support, uh, social support, as it's called, uh, organizational programs and support structures that are in place. Those tend to be more, as I would think of it again as a dispositional psychologist, I would tend to think of those as uh, playing a buffering or supporting role for individual resilience. I told you we work with high-risk operational personnel, and that's sort of our code word. Um, but it really defines a family of jobs, uh, not one particular job, that have in common some characteristics, not all characteristics for all uh, particular mission sets. But generally, we're talking about folks who perform missions uh, with sensitive uh, national security concerns oftentimes. 
there are conditions of extreme threat uh, or extreme environmental demands. Uh, there's t typically very little logistical or tactical support, and the consequences for mission failure are fairly dire. We have looked at the kinds of characteristics or attributes that have been used to define folks who do this kind of work. Um, everyone from astronauts, most known in the room probably are special operations forces that, has been, that have been talked about. Certain police law enforcement uh, groups, like special tactical police organizations would probably fall within our definition, as would um, sort of bomb disposal folks um, and clandestine intelligence operatives as well. Folks who do this work, one of the most commonly described attributes from job analyses is high stress tolerance. So not surprisingly, that you know, is another term for describing resilience. Again, a little bit confusing, lots of definitions out there, but generally we're talking about highly resilient people. Not surprisingly, uh, that resilience is tested in these folks. Uh, it's not enough to say, hey, I'm resilient, pick me. We go ahead and subject them to tests of their resilience. And um, folks uh, routinely go through these very rigorous assessment and selection courses. You've heard uh, about uh, Special Forces Assessment and Selection uh, the past couple of days, folks alluding to it and talking about it. And there are others out there that are, be, that are more, spe that more specialized, that are specialized for other kinds of positions as well. NASA just finished with its selection program, and you may recall that uh, last week we announced a new group of astronauts will be beginning training uh, starting in August. The programs that are used to select um, high-risk operational personnel are extremely rigorous. They're designed that way to test special skills and aptitudes for learning special skills um, and performance under stress. And typically the stress um, is designed to be highly, uh, well, we say high fidelity to the operational environment. So things like uh, sleep deprivation, sleep restriction, food restriction, um, and uh, extreme physical loads are used typically to induce stress uh, by way of depleting the individual of their resources. And in, in many ways, these provide an ideal naturalistic environment outside the laboratory to study resilience. This is a typical model. Most programs that are out there uh, descend from the program designed by the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. And so uh, they have a couple phases to them. We, we, the model we use has three phases, or that we did in my past work, I should say, had three phases. Um, generally, the first is a highly intensive uh, screening process where we do the psychological screening as well as other screenings. Um, and then the assessment course itself, these typically are extended. They can run three weeks or longer. And then finally, all that information is looked at by a board of commanders and subject matter experts who make a decision as to whether or not the individual has what it takes to be trained. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, attrition rates are fairly high, um, generally above 50%. So there are some things from the literature and some things from our own experience that are pretty um, robust predictors of uh, success in these programs. Physical ability, first of all. As I said, they're highly physically um, uh, structured. So not surprisingly, physical fitness plays an important predictive role. It's a weak but significant linear relationship. But what's more interesting about it is the nonlinear aspect, which is that it takes a fairly high level of physical fitness to be um, to be uh, successful. And uh, it isn't sort of a monotonic relationship. It sort of levels off. But folks who, in our particular program, who score below um, 270 on the Army physical fitness test, which is about 90% of the points, 300 points, um, typically have a much higher failure rate than folks who score above, I'm sorry, at 300, which is about uh, 10 percent of our population, and those folks have almost twice the selection rate of folks who fall in between that. So it's a funny distribution. Cognitive ability is another one of those robust predictors. You know, it's said out there that cognitive ability predicts everything, so no surprise that it predicts success in even these physically rigorous selection programs. 
And the question naturally arises as to why that might be. Again, a weak but significant <coughs> linear predictor. And, it, and for us, the issue of the nonlinear relationships are very interesting. Um, is there a point it, at which cognitive ability is no longer, we're, we're sort of necessary but not sufficient. You, you kind of gut enough. And uh, what we do know is folks at the lower reaches of the ability levels, and I'm not talking low for the general population, I'm talking low for a select population. So this is sort of to the lower reaches of the above average range of the population in general. Um, again, have a much a higher rate of attrition from, from these rigorous selection programs. Why might that be? Well, it might be interesting to think about age as, I'm sorry, uh, cognitive ability as a proxy measure for something called brain or cognitive reserve capacity. This is something that's being studied in the neurosciences now, looking at uh, basically the ameliorating effects of disease in neurodegenerative disorders. But this idea of the more a cognitive reserve you have, the better able you are to withstand the disabling effects of neurologic disease. Well, taking that to this induced depleting state of a selection program, those with higher cognitive ability seem to be able to withstand these, these uh, pressures without having as many performance failures. So it may be that it's a relationship to this cognitive or brain reserve capacity. Now, age in our assessment center is a very interesting predictor. And it's a sort of a bad news story for anybody 35 or older, just saying, you know. Um, we say it's all downhill after 35. God, in our curve, it's significantly downhill after 35. Even though age is a linear predictor, again, a weak linear predictor. But I don't think I'll have the time to show you that slide, but if you're interested, I'll show you later. Um, that um, curve just drops off at, for whatever reason, at age 35. And there'll be some, and levels off again about age 40 uh, at a low, low rate of success. So we don't want to go out selecting folks above the age of 35, or recruiting folks above the age of 35. More inconsistent predictors for us are things like personality traits. And, um, you know, uh, I think it was Dr. Wong this morning mentioned the openness to experience scale of the NEO PIR, one of the common mentions of what's called a five factor model of personality. Well, in that five factor model of personality, there are things like emotional stability and conscientiousness. Well, those two dimensions are where it's thought that resilience might reside within the personality. And uh, conscientiousness and emotional stability do show some significant relationships when it comes to prediction in assessment centers, uh, specifically in the world of work more broadly, not so much in these specialized programs. They're not as consistent. What is emerging uh, more interestingly of late are constructs like hardiness and grit. And I know that's been talked about. People might be aware of that. Um, uh, grit is, uh, no, is uh, a more recent construct, but you know, antecedents of these have been around for a long time, and sort of like new wine and uh, old wine and new bottles. You know, um, you know, maybe maybe uh, again we have a little problem with construct labeling, but but grit is the idea that uh, one has a sustained and passionate uh, pursuit of their goal, interest, strong, strong perseverance, and then this idea of hardiness which is a broader construct of resilience, which gets into sort of three components. Commitment, uh, the capacity to feel deeply involved or engaged in an activity. Um, control, the idea that one can control events around them, which is really important in these assessment and selection programs in which they are largely uncontrollable stressors. So it's interesting that if you have this high ability to think that you're in control of your environment, when it's designed to present you with ambiguity and uncontrollability, sort of interesting that that might play a role. And then what was mentioned earlier this morning as well, uh, this idea of seeing things as challenges rather than threats, the ability to perceive variety and change as a chance to learn and grow, the sort of positive aspects of being uh, under stress or adversity. And these have been shown to emerge as predictors in the U.S. Army Special Forces Assessment and Selection Program. We've had more mixed results with them, and it suggests that these relationships are a little more nuanced than that, although we have seen some uh, effects. I do want to just touch on what our approach has been, which is a little bit unique, and that is we work on, as, a, as clinical psychologists, on a construct we call uh, psychological suitability. And this emerges from um, 
semi-structured interviews designed to look at the whole individual's uh, life and looking at particular life history indicators of both problematic um, behavior and, and positive uh, resilience. And these are some of the dimensions we look at. Look at. It's a five-component rating. Um, you can see the dimensions that we're interested in. Probably not a great surprise to you to see those. Uh, a little bit of the content from the interview. And again, in the interest of time, I can certainly, if you're more interested, I have other things that you can see about this. But um, the kinds of things that we're interested in. And what we do is we derive a rating of suitability on a four-point scale with half steps. So it's a seven-point scale, although we don't, as a typical psychologists, we don't use all the scale. Um, and uh, what we have uh, noted um, in our group is that psychological suitability is rated on the basis of these life history indicators, proves to be a better predictor of successful selection than does some of the other predictors that have emerged. And again, you see what I have been referring to, this sort of non-linear relationship there is once you get to a certain point, more is not necessarily better. Uh, there's a much difference between a 60% to 63% selection, probably not. But if you're in those lower reaches of that scale, that 19% is pretty significant. And I can also tell you that when we look at training outcomes down the road, those lower suitability ratings also have a higher attrition rate from training. So it, there is something to looking at um, you know, the holistic piece of this. Okay, well, what do we know? Um, we know that these suitability ratings do predict better for us, for us, cognitive ability, personality, do, and uh, physical fitness. They add, they add into regression models, they add variance. But we generally, and we have seen this over about 25 years of use, 20 years of use of, the, of this measure, that when we factor analyze this, we get one dimension, not five. And, and we're kind of not sure what that dimension is, could be measurement error because psychologists don't use the whole scale. It could be halo effect because we see good or bad and that's it. Uh, we don't think that's the case. Um, and going back a little bit, back to the OSS, you find that when they looked at their overall measure of suitability, they called it an estimate of the total potentialities of candidates for meeting the challenges of life. And boy, that sure sounds like a resilience definition to me. So that's what we think we might be capturing. <coughs> I hesitate to put this slide up. I'm going to get in trouble, I know. But um, I will at least say this about, about this. Um, we think we might be tapping into something that uh, evolutionary biologists and psychologists have been calling a biological fitness factor. Um, down at the bottom row there, you see our measures in operational assessment programs. G meaning general mental ability, general factor of personality psychopathology, all the things that we're interested in contributing to a, a, a higher order abstract factor known as neurodevelopmental stability. And then below, and next to that, this idea of general health, um, where we are probably capturing physical ability, uh, the high, these extreme tests of physical ability as, as good proxy measures for the overall health and fitness of the individual as a measure perhaps of immunocompetence. I'm not going to talk about that far left side of the, of the chart, but all contributing to an abstract factor called fitness factor. And the belief is this might, and this is where the problem begins, so I know this much, so the questions get hard, I'm going to rely on you to answer them, but this idea that it might reflect the underlying genetic mutation load of the individual, and that it is a measure where, where now these constructs at the bottom become, become indicators of the overall genetic fitness of the individual. Um, pretty, um, pretty controversial stuff, um, but it's a nice heuristic for looking at why these predictors seem to come together in these high-risk assessment selection programs. Well, again, the pessimistic clinical psychologist says not all soldiers can become super soldiers, and it may be an unpopular message to send to you, <coughs> that we may actually need to deliberately recruit and select specifically for resilience. That said, uh, resilience as a resource has to be preserved, conserved um, through good leadership, good policies, good practices, um, and programming that, that um, my colleagues this morning have talked about. 
Um, and finally, um, and I say this as a may, the others are, the first is a must, it must be conserved, but resi resilience may be enhanced by external factors, things like uh, social support networks, maybe other kinds of interventions that are being researched now having to do with more biologically based interventions. There may be room in the construct for that. It's not my area and it's a bit controversial.